And we are live in Yukon, Oklahoma. All right. Let's see if I can get this to advance. All right, there we are. So uh, we have studied Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Rebecca last week. And this week we're doing Melchizedek. And that is the correct spelling. <laughs> and i like to know who is Melchizedek and what do you all know about Melchizedek? He has no beginning and no end. All right. What else? He's mentioned once, twice, twice. We'll see. All right. What else? Well, who is he though? What? He's a high priest of what? He's the king of Salem. Salem, Massachusetts. No. <laughs> Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay. What else do we know? Abraham gave him a tenth. Of his Abraham life. gave him a tithe. It's like, what's that all about? All right. Um, you know, this guy just shows up out of the blue. No one ever heard of him. And then he goes away for over a thousand years. No one hears him again. So it's going to be interesting uh, as we discover more and more about who this person is. So what we have right now is the name or the word Melchizedek. It comes from a noun and a verb put together. So the noun is Melech. That means king. And the verb is Sedek. And that means just or righteous. So when you put those together, it means King of Righteousness. Now, what's interesting here, it's not a name. It's a title. He is the King of Righteousness. And people always give it as a name. Uh, a personal name, actually. But in the Hebrew language, you take the noun and the verb, you put them together, and you don't give any more information. It is the title. So, we have a title here. And because it's a title... We need to know more about what that means. Okay, so this study is going to go into more about the background before we get to Melchizedek. Now, remember I had this chronology of the patriarchs slides a, a, a few weeks ago. And um, I've added a little bit of comments to it. That long line right there is the flood line. And so everything to the left, they're dead. Things on the right or after the flood. And notice here, we have Shem. Right above him is Noah. So Shem is Noah's son. Noah lived long enough during the timeline here that he's, he's also in the same time as Abraham. And Shem, surprisingly, lived beyond Abraham's life. Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, the bottom here is Abraham's life. And look, Shem is beyond. And in the middle here of uh, Abraham's life is Noah's line. So we got two information there. The dotted line is Noah when he and his life, okay. when his life ended. He was in the, in the early parts of Abraham's life. And Abram, the colors here, the lighter color means they didn't have their first son yet. And then the darker is after the first son. All right. So, but Shem lived well beyond uh, Abram's. And so that's going to give you some information. Now, this is what the Jewish encyclopedia says. It says the oral traditions identify Melchizedek as being Shem. Shem, that's, that's their oral traditions. It's in uh, multiple areas of, of their Mishnah, the Targum, and some other things. And so, to the Jewish rabbis, uh, in order to understand who Melchizedek is, they believe it was Shem, and his title was he was the king of righteousness. He was the one that brought the, the, uh, the knowledge of uh, Jehovah or Yahweh to the area. Now, what's interesting here is that 
Um, he's the king of Salem, as we said earlier. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, so you mean Shem is in the middle of the Canaanites? See, that's all, that's all the land of the giants and everything. So we'll see what, what that's all about also. But just to kind of give you a little background, that's why they think it's Shem, because Shem lived that long. And Shem would be the one that was keeping up the knowledge all the way back to Adam. So it's not a title that was. Say it again? It's not a title that was. Yeah. Um, so she's asking, was it a title? Or she's making a statement. It was not a title passed on. She's asking it as a question. And um, we're going to learn more about what that uh, office of Melchizedek means. But yes, it is definitely passed on. Um, so the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is the uh, was found in the 1940s, 47, around there. The Dead Sea Scrolls is a lot of religious writings that were collected by the Essenes. The Essenes is a group of priests that a lot of people don't realize that you have three priest groups in the time of Jesus. You, you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then you have the Essenes, which are Zadoks. Zadok is a one of the kings of righteousness, and I'm not going to give you the full history of all of those because it's all in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm still studying it, uh, but I have uh, spent a lot of hours studying that. But it, it, it gets hard to follow because you're talking about oral traditions and it's hard to line it up with uh, you know, real chronological numbers and so on. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick to the stuff that we definitely do know. And, um, and then every so often I might throw out there a little nugget from the Dead Sea Scrolls. If it pops in my head, who knows? All right. So with that, um, you have a period of time right after the flood and right after the Tower of Babel that the 70 nations are dispersed. These are the sons of Noah, and where do they all go? So you have uh, Ham. He went, all, all of his family members went uh, to the west, and they took up uh, this, this picture right now, the Table of Nations is showing where the tribes all went for Ham. He's the green, and they're all over in northern Africa, and they spread all the way through Africa. Then you have Japheth. By the way, Japheth is the oldest in the family, okay? So a lot of people wanted to know, well, wait, I thought Shem, he got all the, 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 the birthrights. He was the second born. So the first born, Japheth, is uh, all of his people went east and north. So they went into India and they went over into Europe. So uh, all, all their uh, family members spread out that way. And then Shem... Uh, which uh, we will get the Messiah will come from the family of Shem. Shem is uh, the uh, Arabian desert area and Persia, uh, Babylon today. And then they have some parts of it came over when Abraham uh, moved uh, toward Canaanite or toward Canaan. Uh, we see that some of it is also belonging to Shem. Uh, but this map here kind of shows you where the different descendants went. And we have now validated most of this information through uh, blood types and uh, blood genealogy, which is fascinating also all by itself. Um, I'm reading a book on that right now called Trace. It's tracing out all these bloodlines all through history. And as we now also, uh, through uh, blood genealogy and the DNA, we can also identify the actual priests of the Levite family. So, uh, and they have the original names, a lot of them, like, like uh, in, in Hebrew, uh, a priest is called a Khan, a Khanet. And so you can see family names like a Khan, K-A-H-N, things like that, that they're under the lineage of the Levi's. And so uh, today Israel is collecting all those people back together. They're trying to create the priesthood again. And they got the temple uh, getting ready. So that's all happening right now. Yeah, with the red heifer, and, and it all dates back to this. So, you know, it's fascinating information. I want you to see where all these people are at, because they do play into this order of Melchizedek and so on, and we'll get more information as we move on. So the first mention of Melchizedek is in Genesis 14. Now, we went over Genesis 14. 
That was the big battle of the nine kings. You guys remember that one? That was really cool. We got the four kings of the east from Babylon who have conquered the five kings of Canaan down by Sodom and Gomorrah, that area. And after, uh, after 12 years of them paying tribute to those four kings, those eastern kings, the, the, the kings of Canaan rebelled. And when they rebelled in the 13th year, then this, this king, uh, Shador Laomir, he and three other kings came across from the east, conquered all these, these uh, kings of, the, of Canaan who were uh, rebelling, and they made a major mistake when they did that. Because when they conquered uh, Solomon and Gomorrah, they took Lot and his family as prisoners. That's a mistake. Because now they're going to deal with the most powerful tribal uh, leader in the area, which is Abram. He is super powerful by this time. And so uh, we pick up that story that he decided to get, get his army. Remember, he had his own trained army of 318 men. And he took off after uh, Shador Laomir and the other three kings. And chased them all the way up to Damascus from the southern part of below south part of Jerusalem all the way north to Damascus. And they caught up to these four kings and they did a night attack. It's the first night attack that's talked about in the Bible where Abraham, at this time his name is Abram, Abram uh, took half of his forces underneath and took the other half and ran them around the top part and then trapped the... Uh, these four kings. Yeah, there's a map, but I don't have it for this story. Yeah, because that wasn't the last time I was teaching. I have a map from then. You can go back and watch it on the YouTube. All right, so then there's this big battle, and it says he slaughtered them. It was, you know, and these were, these were powerful kings. They had already defeated the Rephaims and some other, some, some of the giant families. They'd already defeated them, so they were pretty powerful, but... They weren't powerful enough when they went against God. And Abram had God on his side. So now he's on the return. So now we pick up the story. He's coming back with Lot. He's rescued Lot and rescued all the others. And this is what it says here, verse 17. After his return, that is Abram, after his return from the defeat of Shador Laomir and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram at the valley of Sheveh. That is the King's Valley. By the way, in the, in the writing here, the Valley of Shaved would be the original writing. And then an editor put in there a modern way of looking at it when it was being written uh, with, with Moses. And that was, you know, it's the King's Valley. So we would know where it was at because it, it didn't have the name Shaved anymore. All right. So there's a little edit in there. And at that point, at the Valley of Shaved and Melchizedek, King of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. God Most High there is El Elyon. Now, we'll take a moment and look at this. The king of Sodom is the bad guy, remember? And he's the one that, he, he wants to come out and give stuff to Abram. Abram says, no, I don't want your stuff. I don't want, I don't want anybody to say that I became rich because of you. I'm rich because of God, all right? Well, it tells us a little bit about that, but suddenly, in the middle of the story, this guy, Melchizedek, shows up. Says he's the king of Salem, and he brought out bread and wine. What's that all about? Bread and wine. Yeah, it's, it's, so... Bread and wine will continue throughout the entire Bible all the way to the night before Jesus is crucified, where they will do the bread and wine. He says, take this bread, my body, take the wine, it's my blood. And but So we'll see that thread from now on, from this point forward, bread and wine becomes an important part of throughout the Bible. Well, it's, go ahead. So she's asking, does the language of this 
explain to us what kind of bread it is? And I didn't do a study on that. So I will leave that up to Kiana to find out, and maybe she can update us next week. Yep, next week, homework assignment. All right. But most likely, she'll look it up right now on her, on her little phone. <laughs> All right, so, and, and same thing with the wine. Is the wine real wine, or is it grape juice? I mean, you know, all that kind of story, all right? I know. You get all kinds of weird stuff in a Baptist church, because the Baptists don't want you to think about real wine, you know, because uh, they're, they're teetoters, all right? And so, which I don't blame, you know, because there's a whole lot of mess that happens when people get drunk, all right? And the Bible says, uh, you know, don't be, don't be uh, drinking wine in excess wherein you are drunk. Yeah, Lot, you know. <laughs> Noah. What happened to Noah? Okay, he's the first guy to start it all. All right. So uh, I'm not going to go into that, you know, those little nuances like that. But do understand, bread and wine is a part of being blessed. It's a blessing. He's about ready to give a blessing to Abram. And he's representing God Almighty. And he's a king in the middle of a pagan culture. Pagans all around him. And yet he is the priest of God Most High. So, El El Yon. Now, El, there are several other gods in that area. And they're all called Els. All right? So, and Elohim can be a God, uh, the creator. It could also be uh, the name of 70 of his fallen angels. They're Elohims also. He's got a council. So we're not going to go into that much detail right now, but later we might do some more studying on the council of God and the Elohim. But here he says of all the Els, he is the most high. He is the one who's the creator. We're going to find out in a moment, the creator of all. He's not a created being. All right. So he, and this priest here is that he is the priest of the one true God. Abraham will recognize that. So Abraham's not in this culture by himself as a believer. There are others. And as I said earlier, the Jews uh, believe that this is Shem, you know, that he is a, a true believer. So we have, he's a priest of God most high. Well, we go a little bit further here and we look at where does this take place at? So I do have a map for that purpose for Katina who was asking about a map. All right. So I want you to notice something interesting here. We have... Uh, the Kindred Valley on that side and the Hinnon Valley on the left side. In the center here above my big red circle is Jerusalem. That's what the size of it and what it would look like during this period of time. And further north was where later on Abraham will take uh, his son to go sacrifice him up there on Mount Moriah. So you can see, and today Mount Moriah is up near the temple area. So the, the temple area is further north. And then you have Salem or Shalem is the correct way of pronouncing it. And Shalem here is Jerusalem uh, later. And then you have the two valleys. Well, where the two valleys intersect, the Valley of Kindred and the Valley of Hinnon, when they intersect, that area is the Valley of the question that we're talking about right now, Shave, the, the King's Valley, the King's Valley right there. And this is where this big meeting is going to take place. It's just below the Mount of Olives. Okay, so you start to see some of the geography here. Later on, all that will play in also as we get all the way up to Jesus' days. All right. So the Valley of Shave and the King's Valley. I thought it was interesting when I found out that it was right there. I was thinking that it was some other location. But when I went and got the map and looked it up, I said, oh, oh, it's right there, just down below Mount Moriah. A little bit of a walk. Not much. <laughs> yeah, so this is the time of Abram, and that town is pretty big. And Shem, or Metezdek, is the, the king of it. And what that means is this. Every little town had a ruler. <laughs> and so archaeologists will call these uh, city-states. They're a city-state. And they would have a king over that. 
and, and the word here for king means a ruler, all right? So we, we know king real fast in our vocabulary. We, we immediately know, oh, that's elevated. But you might think of him also as being like a governor, you know, the mayor of the city. There's different ways of, of doing this. But it also means that um, everybody in the region would have known about this guy. It was up north of it on the big hill. The, the tallest peak is where they went to do the sacrifice. And so uh, that's that comes later, though. That's, you know, that that's... Last week. It, it, yeah, that was last week's lesson, but it's, it's later in this story here. All right. So, yeah, I thought this was fascinating how that happened. All right, let's go a little bit further now. So the story continues. <coughs> and Melchizedek blessed Abram and said... Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who hath delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Oh, this is the most, most important question for Jews. Levi, uh, Aaron, high priest, everybody gives tithes to them. They give tithes to the to the Levi's or to Aaron. But Aaron and Levi is coming out of the loins of Abraham. So in essence, Levi is given a tithe to Melchizedek. That's how a rabbi would think about this. The family members are lower than the person that is receiving the blessing. And the person receiving the blessing here is Abram. He's the top of all that. And yet Abraham is giving the tithes up to Melchizedek. Showing that he recognizes Melchizedek has a higher priestly order in God's, God's kingdom than even his own descendants later on will have. So Aaron, and this becomes important. Uh, Jesus will have a big argument about this with the Pharisees. And, uh, but they, um, they are subservient to Melchizedek. Melchizedek has a higher priest order is what this is referring to here. So notice he calls them, you were blessed by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, meaning, and the word for possessor means that the creator of, of heaven and earth, of all things, you've been blessed by him, and he's delivered his your the enemies into your hands. So everything Abraham has is not because of Abraham. It's all because of El Elyon. It's all because of God most high. And so Abram recognizes that and gives a tenth. By the way, um, the tenth, the tithe, is actually the amount that's due to a king or it's also due to God from all your blessings. So um, it's, uh, this, is a, this is a big changing point for the Jews in this story right now. There's Melchizedek coming in and no one knows who he is. And then that's why I think they came up with the story that he's Shem. So they have a, a saving face, you know, <laughs> giving the ties to Shem. And um, we'll move on. So unless anybody's got some questions about it. Well, they don't recognize, you know, we might, I, I think we have discussed that it's at least the tithe of Jesus. Yeah. If not Jesus himself. <clears throat> Yeah, their, that, their, their Messiah, <coughs> so they've got to attribute it to somebody else. Yeah, you since know? they since they're not recognizing the future, this is being a type of something else. Yeah. But some of the rabbis will begin to think that way. We'll see that as we get further down. Um, you know, Nicodemus and other uh, priests that were there, they start recognizing this also. Yeah. Well, let's move on because there's quite a bit here. Yes. Yeah, this is this is this is 450 years before Moses and the 12 tribes are designated. This is this is you know almost five centuries before that happens. All right, so I want to take a moment and show you a story that happens with Jesus and tie it back in. Jesus is talking to in one day he meets up with Herodians 
They are they, they, uh, from the family of Herod, and they're arguing about how they are, they're trying to trap him. A political trap. He easily gets through that. Then the Sadducees try to give him a, a religious trap, and he gets through that. And then the Pharisees, they try to, you know, that's the one where they have, if the person dies, they get married, they die and get married, anyway, blah, blah, blah. What's going to happen in heaven? So he gets through all that. So now Jesus says, I have a question for you. So we're going to look at that, all right? So this is in Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, verse 42 says, And so Jesus asked the Pharisees, Whose son is the Christ? Whose son is it? Now, you guys will all be able to answer that real fast, right? David. The, the, the son, the Messiah will come from David. So they answer it. They said the son of David, of course. Now Jesus is going to trap them, yeah. all right? Well, Jesus then said, how is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord? In Matthew twenty-two forty-three, 43, he's going to quote from Psalm 110. And Psalm 110, verse 1 says, my Lord said to the Lord. You see? So he's, there, there's some interesting vocabulary there. Two lords are being mentioned. And we're going to bring them out here in a moment because I'll show you the verses. But I'm, I'm summarizing the story for you first. So he says, how is it then that David, oh, notice here that Jesus recognizes that David and the scriptures of Psalms is scripture because it's in the spirit. David said this in the spirit. And if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? How's the Messiah, the son of David, if David's calling him his Lord? They didn't understand that. They, they said, well, no one was able to answer that. Matter of fact, this is the best part. And from that day forward, no one dared ask him any more questions. <laughs> we are not asking Jesus any more questions. All right. So let me show you the section he, that he's referring to. All right. So what is his son's name? So in Psalm 110, this is what it says. The Lord, all capital letters, the Lord says to my Lord, lower letters, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So this is what Jesus is referring to. Why does David call his son his Lord? If, if the Messiah is, and they all know that this Psalm 110 is about the Messiah. There's a lot in here. We'll show you in a little bit. But notice it says, the Lord says to my Lord, and if you have one of those kind of Bibles that are like this one, where it's all capital letters, it helps you know that is the name Yahweh, the, the name of God, and some people would pronounce it as Jehovah. So Yahweh, uh, the, the, the Tetragrammaton, the four letters of the Hebrew name for God, is all capital letters for us. And then the little Lord that you would recognize, that's the word Adonai. So we have Yahweh and Adonai. Why does Yahweh say to Adonai, sit at my right hand? So there's a question there. Well, while we're looking at this, I just, I just have to show this to you. This is our Proverbs. Listen to this. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? God. Who has gathered the winds in his fists? God. Who has wrapped up the waters in the garment? God. Who has established all the ends of the earth? God. What is his name? God. And what's his son's name? Surely you know. So anyways, this is also... Really baffling to Jews. All right. But I'm going to move on now because that's not our study. But I just threw that in there just for the fun of it. All right. Yeah, it is. To, to anybody who's a descendant from Abraham, you know, it, it's very baffling. Uh, all right. So anyways, back to the Lord says to my Lord. In verse 4 is where we get the next mention of Melchizedek. In that, so it says in verse 4, And the Lord, Yahweh, has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what's happening here is this is a psalm about the Messiah. And he says here that Yahweh swears an oath. Okay, the only time Yahweh swears an oath is when it's something that will never, ever be changed. And because there's nobody else that he can swear to, he's got to swear to himself. Because he's, he's the, the, the eternal one. So he swears an oath 
And it says he will never repent. He won't ever change his mind. You is referring to the Messiah. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this is the first time it's come back in the Bible since back in Abraham days. This is almost a thousand years later. So in Melchizedek, the first time, and then 950 years later is Psalm 110. So it's over almost a thousand years no one ever talked about this guy. And yet suddenly... David, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, says, and you, the Messiah, will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. I was like, what in the world's going on here? So for, for the Jews, they're looking at that going, what order of Melchizedek? What, what is going on here? She brings up a great point. It would appear that there's a lot of background here that we're not getting in scriptures because it's oral traditions. By the time it gets to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, Hebrews will have four chapters on this guy. But yet, we have no other information in the Bible. God does it on purpose. All the oral traditions are good to know, but the Bible is setting up a pattern for us. This person... Melchizedek has no beginning, no end. We don't see his birth. His The book of Genesis, let's face it, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. And yet we see no beginning from Melchizedek. Okay? Because that's what Genesis means, beginning. All right? So we don't see that. And now, in Psalms, a thousand years later, we see, hey, he's going to be, the Messiah will be a priest after this order. Forever a priest. Wait a minute. How can that be when priests come from Aaron? The order of Aaron. That's where priests come from. The high priest of the temple got to be a direct descendant from Aaron. So they have a beginning. They have a beginning. All right? Yes, Aaron is a descendant from Shem. He's a Shemanite. The Shemanites are the Jews. All right? So we have a problem here. <clears throat> How can he be a priest when it's not from Aaron? It's from Melchizedek. This, this is, that don't make any sense. It's baffling. It's a mystery. So let's go a little further and see if we can discover some more about this. Are you guys liking this? Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating, huh? All right. Yeah. So they got to tie it back in somehow to their family. So Shem. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she's bringing up that point that Okay, so let's go a little bit further now. We now go for another long period of time from David until you get to the book of Hebrews. This is, um, you know, the end of Malachi until you get to Matthew is 400 years of no prophecy, nothing in there. So we call it the silent years oftentimes. So, this is, you know, in Malachi, the last book in the Bible, was 500 years after David. So there's, there's lots of time going by. And suddenly now, we get in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. It starts in chapter 6 at the end. But chapter 7 says this, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. That's, we just read that, right? We all, we all follow that. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. So he gave his tithe to Melchizedek. He is first, now let's talk about Melchizedek. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. I already showed you that, right? His, his name is translated king of righteousness. And then he's also the king of Salem. Salem is the word peace. He is also the king of peace. So Melchizedek is king of righteousness, king of peace. And the author of, of Hebrews is trying to make a point that Jesus is above the, the old priesthood. He's going to be underneath this order. So we go a little bit further now. <clears throat> He, Melchizedek, he is without father, 
or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. That's exactly right. So she just now said, for those who are on the recording who don't hear this, so he's not Shem. <clears throat> Let's go a little further. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. So we see right away here something strange. Melchizedek doesn't have a father or mother, don't have no genealogy. He don't have a beginning, he don't have an end. But he resembles the Son of God. And um, so some people, some really, really good theologians and scholars, which I disagree with, but they have said that this was a pre-incarnation of Jesus in the Old Testament. They call that a Christology. A, it's a, but uh, no, it says right here, uh, it resembles, but it's not him. It doesn't say that Jesus was the person. It just says that this person, for some reason, we, we don't know anything about his father and mother genealogy. No beginning, no end. We know nothing about him. But we do know that he resembles the Son of God. And we do know that Abraham gave him a tenth, a, a, a tithe. So let's go a little bit further and see what we can find out. So without father, without mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days, without end of life, made like the Son of God. So... So she's asking maybe the Holy Spirit, and that is one of the theories, is that this was that the Holy Spirit working, but the Holy Spirit has never, ever revealed himself. Remember, he is one that doesn't draw attention to himself. He draws attention only to the Son. So this is what I think, and you guys can judge this and say what you want. I think that Moses knew he was setting up a type of the future Messiah, and he's following exactly what God tells him to write, and so when he introduced Melchizedek, he purposefully did not give him the father, the mother, the genealogy, the beginning or the ending, because it's a type that in the future will be fulfilled by the Messiah. And so we'll see that. So I think that in order for us to know um, about this guy, it's, it's all going to be a mystery until we get to Jesus himself. And then Jesus will reveal what this all means. That's my thinking. And I, I've spent a, probably a good uh, 20 or, or more hours going through a bunch of uh, videos and commentaries. And I saw some, some of my favorite teachers, I disagreed with them. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't. Because, you know, he's definitely not going to be Jesus since uh, it says that, you know, in, in these verses, it was Jesus there. So anyways, but that just lets you know that it's still a mystery even, you know, today. Let's go a little further, Dan. See what happens here. So it says he'll be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So perfection was not obtainable by the Levitical priesthood. That's the first thing we find out. The Levitical priesthood, the, the, the order of Aaron, you can't become perfect by following it. Okay? And that means that there's a need for another priesthood. The order of Melchizedek. Excuse me, the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews 7, 11, um, it's not the order of Aaron, the Levitical order. Instead, Jesus became a priest not because of the basis of family. He's not from the line of, Le of Levite or, or Levite. It's not by family and it's not a legal requirement that he becomes a priest. Hebrews 7, 16 says he became the priest because he has the power of indestructible life. Indestructible life makes him a priest forever. That is good news. Because if it was a priest based off a of family or based off of the legal requirements, then it can't go on for eternity. So those things come to an end. Just a little before that, I heard the Canadian priest was really as well. So she's referring to the verse right before this, talks about when there's a change in in a priesthood or a law, uh, there, there's got to be a change in the law in order for that to take place. 
So there's been a change here. I wasn't going to all the details. I was giving you the Hebrews 7 so you can read it. Actually, Hebrews 6, let's see, 5, 6, 7, and 8, four chapters you'd like to read. But I'm giving you some summaries here since we only have, you know, a few minutes for our class. Well, look at what else. Our high priest, Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek, says that in Hebrews 7, 25, Jesus saves us to the uttermost and he makes intercession for us. So what this means is this. When Jesus died and then he rose again, his resurrection, 40 days later, he ascended. When he ascended, he sits at the throne of God right now, the right-hand side, as a high priest. He's a king priest. As a priest right now, the Bible says there would come a day when he'd come back as the king and rule. And people are not going to be too happy about that also. Because he rules with an iron rod. right? But as a priest right now, what's he doing? In heaven right now says that he is evermore interceding on our behalf. He knows what we go through. He's been through it himself. And as our priest, he knows about the, the, the problems we deal with in life and that you know he prays on our behalf. It's interesting that he is as man sitting at the throne praying for us. We always think of Jesus as God, but he's the God man. So as the man part, He's following the order of Melchizedek. He is interceding on our behalf as a priest. A priest's job is to intervene between God and mankind. And that's what he's doing. So he's, he's intervening. Well, we got a little bit more information. Revelation 1. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right, so I want to point out something to you. There are only three in the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, only three that hold the positions of king and priest. Melchizedek, king and priest. Jesus, king and priest. And you and I, king and priest. So, only three. And Melchizedek, Jesus, and us. That means that you have a function. You are actively involved in the kingdom right now. Actively involved as kings, queens, priests, priestess. You have a role to play as a part of the order of Melchizedek. It's, it's like, what? What? That's pretty mysterious. It's the eternal priesthood. <laughs> eternal kingship, eternal priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. And all, believers royal and all of us are royal priests. We're royal because we're kings. Queens. And holy, kings. holy, set aside, set apart. So... <laughs> So, um, well, I'm, I'm still an acolyte. Acolyte, that's yeah. fine. You can be a neophyte as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to go through the shadows and types now that we should have already picked up now from the story. There's a lot more here, and you can go back and read up on some more. But I want to go through the obvious ones and the next, the last ten minutes of class. So, Melchizedek's name means King of Righteousness, and it says in Jeremiah 23 that the Christ is. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. He will be the Lord, or King of righteousness also. So we see there a tie back. The next one, shadow or type, Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which became Jerusalem. The word Salem means peace. He was king of Salem before David was king of Salem. Okay? King of Salem... And then we have Christ is the Prince of Peace, the rightful King of Jerusalem for all of time. It says in Isaiah 9, the government will be upon his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. And it's funny because everybody normally say, you know, the, the Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. And 
the Father of Eternity is, they say, the everlasting Father. But, so if, if, the, if, if the song and King James says, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, actually the word here is about the Son, who is not the Everlasting Father. He is the Father of Eternity. He's the one that created the, 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 the worlds and time. And so Hebrew language puts it in a different order than the King James. Anyways, I thought that was in. Plus, he's the Prince of Peace. That's what he is, and that's what Melchizedek was all about. All right, let's see the next one. Melchizedek was a priest of God most high before Aaron and before the Levitical priesthood. Genesis 14. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. Christ is high priesthood. He precedes and is superior to any other priesthood. It says in Hebrews 7, God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. And that was before uh, Aaron and before the, the Levites. So it's considered to be superior. Then we also have the Old Testament priests offered blessings to God's people. Uh, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. And that's in number six. And it's all about Aaron was the first high priest, and God had to teach him how to be a high priest. And the first thing you do as a priest is you bless people. All right? So that was, that's the first thing he learned how to do. As high priest, Christ blessed God's people with every spiritual blessing. In Ephesians chapter 1, and you ought to mark this and memorize it. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. So the question then, and we have like, you know, seven minutes left. So the discussion question then is the following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Ephesians 1. What are some spiritual blessings that you have seen in your life recently? Never give so up. That's my spiritual blessing. A lot of times I can say I've had enough of this. I'm not putting up with this anymore because I became a Christian and knew exactly what was happening. Yeah. But I didn't. You, I stayed with it. Yeah, I stayed and with I, it. Now I get to see it from it. All right. Yeah. Praise God. Thanks for sharing so that's that with my us. Blessing. Very good. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else like to share uh, spiritual blessings you've seen in your life recently? Yes, yeah, so you took your spiritual blessing of being having gifted as an encourager, and you're encouraging a, another person who has a gift that needs to be encouraged. <laughs> Amen. I think the things that are going on here, the, the number of people that are being brought to, to faith and are being baptized, and the, the growth, um, the children we're working with in the youth department, and yeah, there's this loss of salvation and growth taking place. Amen. Anybody else? <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. I know she's gonna she's gonna do it again. Go ahead.
Yep. We all go through the troubles of life, and yet God sees us through it. Amen. We are all, every one of us are overcomers. And even when we don't feel like it, because it has nothing to do with your feelings. It has to do with walk by faith. God is showing you, even through Melchizedek, that he's at work mysteriously and that he's got a great plan for each one of us. I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer then. All right. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that we can be encouraged. We can look at loved ones. We'll meet up with them one day in your kingdom. We thank you, God, for the work that you're doing in this local church and across our county and all across Oklahoma. We thank you, God, that we can step forward today and maybe not understand what it means to be a king and a priest in in the Melchizedek order, but your spirit's at work in our lives, and you'll help us understand more about how to apply that. And I would pray, Lord, that the test that each of us will encounter this week, we will be successful in representing your kingdom and helping to help others and also overcoming temptations in our own lives because we have a person, Jesus, who's interceding for us. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next week, we do Joseph. Amen. And then we're going to do a woman of Joseph. See if you can figure out who that woman's name is. Ha, ha, ha.